Hello? I'm Billy Carter, for those that don't know me, and uh, I'm supposed to give a little presentation today, and we'll go through your questions, try to solve some of your problems, and hopefully you go away from here with a little more knowledge than you came, and maybe we can share some of that that you have. Uh, how many of you have a Razorback covering on your airplane? Any of you? I know Larry Willocker has it on his, and I wanted to bring up the fact that I have made contact with the owner of that STC, and there is repairs for it. Uh, for those that think your airplane may need recovering, uh, depending on the type of top coat paint that's on it, uh, you know, you can rejuvenate that. Almost all of them. Uh, that would be Randolph, Seekonite, Poly. They do have a rejuvenating paint that you can put on it and it will make your fabric and the dopes and stuff pliable again. Uh, a lot of your top coats, uh, uh, polyurethane and uh, Superflight, they have a pretty epoxy mix top coat on them, but that can still be repaired. Did some fantastic looking jobs. You wouldn't even know that they had holes punched in them from the seat belt left out or uh, bicycle handlebars running into the side of them, lawnmowers putting big cuts in the side of them. They can all be repaired and done flush if the gentleman doing the repair knows how to do it. And you won't even see that it was damaged. Is there uh, any special questions that you come here with today? Got to speak up loud so I can hear it. I understand that the fellows over at Thomasville, one of the Steel boys, and it might be Dale Steel or his brother, that I have gone to Hartzell Propeller, which makes the little uh, alternators, and they will not give me the STC for it. I wanted to get it for the entire Stinson Club. But they said, no, if I wanted to buy even the alternator, I had to go through Doug Steele. And that's over at Thomasville, North Carolina. I believe it goes under Franklin Aircraft Engines. Familiar with him? Uh, to get the alternator and the STC, you'd have to go through him. And I do understand there is one. And it is approved for the Franklin engine also. Any idea where the STC for the 0470 ended up? The question is, uh, where can we get an STC or for an 0470, correct? Mm, all right. What's his name? Cooper. I believe Mr. Cooper over in Washington State. Are you familiar with Cooper? He was at the type club uh, table yesterday and he does have the STC for it. I would think Mr. Cooper would be back at the type table today and he was at the dinner last night with us. So he was, spent most of the day at the table yesterday. He, he'll be back there today. Uh, he was going to believe some business cards, but he had given them all out as of yesterday. Where's the time table? In the antique building. Uh, way back in the far corner this year. So you can't find us. <laughs>
So I'm Brett Chilcott, and I'm just here, here to support Billy. And um, if you're not familiar with the vintage hangar, it's a great place for resources. There are tables in there of the type clubs and they answer all kinds of questions. Billy is the resident expert on Stinson's. Uh, I like promoting the brand. So if you're here and you're thinking about buying a Stinson, uh, you're gonna hear more technical stuff here today. But uh, I have the presentation twice. The next presentation I'll be giving is tomorrow uh, in the vintage hangar at 10 o'clock, and it's more about why should you consider buying a Stinson, okay? Any more questions? A question was brought up to me yesterday about can you put 25 gallon fuel tanks on a small tail Stinson, dash one, dash two, I do know that it has been done. It's been done on a field approval and it involves removing an outboard rib from the original tank and putting the little quarter rib in there like the rest of the bottom of the underneath the tanks, installing that and under a field approval it's been done at least once that I know of. Very simple. If you're concerned about the structure of the airplane with the cross members near the uh, forward wing spar, you can always replace that with a larger and thicker materialed poly, uh, the 4130. Uh, similar to the Dash 3 wings that it has in it. And, and that's all in your uh, uh, parts uh, manual. Billy, I talked to you yesterday about oil. Um, you said typically you should run a straight wing, 50 in the summer, 40 in the cooler winter months. Is there a specific brand that should be run? Or can you elaborate a little bit? Oil, engine oil for your Franklins or basically Lacombe's or Continental's either. Uh, talking to some of the experts that rebuild these engines, they say that the multi-viscosity oil that owners have been using on the engines that they get into repair, they have found more deterioration in cams that have to be replaced from it. The his suggestion was to always use a straight weight oil. Brand, uh, I have an idea that would be owner's preference. Most of my customers use Aerosil. I'm not too sure I understood. The, the question is, is it a big deal to change from multi-viscosity uh, to straight weight, or vice versa? I would say no. No, I, I think uh, uh, when you decide to change, do it and uh, go on with it. it uh, your engine won't know the difference. If, I, if it does, it, it should be overjoyed with it. Is there any support on the heart cell propeller for for 0435? Is support for heart cell propellers for the 0435? None that I know of. I guess we've got what's there, and I don't know of any changes that's been made on it.
Are there any additives recommended for the Franklin, for the oil? None. No additives is recommended for it. In fact, the, the present day oil the lubrication you have has got all of the additives and the uh, minerals that, that it needs in it. Anything else stored in there is money, what I want to say, useless, uselessly spent. Are you thinking about like Only, only if you've got the uh, Lycoming engine that requires it. For the Franklin engine, I, there's no reason for it. Billy, a, Billy, a question that always comes up when I give the presentations on Stinson being the best, best value in aviation, they ask, well, can you still get parts? You wanna to talk to that point? Can we still get parts? Uh, parts are more available now than they were 15 or 20 years ago. Yes, there's uh, uh, new rods, new pistons, new valves. Uh, and I understand Susan is working on getting new cranks uh, manufactured for us. Uh, also cams. So, yes, they are more available now and more reasonable now than they were. And you'll hear a lot of people badmouth Franklin engines. It's baloney. I've had my Franklin engine. I'm running up to 1,100 hours since major overhaul. Yeah, I've uh, repaired some cylinders and whatnot. Take good care of the engine, and she just runs like a sewing machine. And another word on that. Going back. I was involved in the Navy in 1956 and a directive came through to drain all the shell oil that we had, mineral was all that we were using at the time, and go to a detergent oil. If the engines had less than 600 hours, then they were up to 2,000 for an overhaul. If you had over 600 hours, then at 1,200 hours, it had to be overhauled. Okay, Lycoming, Continental, they all jumped onto the same bandwagon. Now, Franklin was out of business, so no one was there to speak for Franklin. But you could use your own choice. The top overhaul recommended back in 46, 48 was at 1,200. If you're using a detergent oil, you could come to your own conclusion. I would say 2,000 hours. I know some that have gone to 2,000, three or 400. So the new oils were really the, the big plus for all of us. <coughs> Oh, that's fine. I didn't hear all the questions. Say about the pistons again. Are they making pistons? Is Lycoming making pistons again for the 435? I heard they're making rings now for the three ring pistons, not the four ring pistons. Is Lycoming making pistons for the 0435? And what was specific on the piston? Three rings. Three rings. I have no idea. Same as the 290. That would that that would be beyond me. I have no idea. Sir, how much trouble is it to replace the fuel system and the tank have to come out? If you have to replace the fuel tank? Fuel cylinder. Oh the fuel cylinders, no. Hopefully whoever did the covering on your wing to remove that fuel cylinder they would have put the access panel and plate in well enough position that you can get to it and unscrew, I believe it's six screws that holds it in there. Uh, real gasket has came out with a real nice thick and it will withstand any type of fuel that you use in your engine, and in your airplane. Uh, no, it's just a matter of undoing your power 
your ground wire and taking those screws out. Also, if you're not familiar with the company, Real Gaskets, that's the name of the company. They're unbelievable. They are much better than uh, the OEMs. Uh, Billy, we got a question here about running 100 low lead versus mo gas in the Franklins and uh, about uh, TCP. Okay, you're, uh, that would depend on you and the purchase of the STC. Now, if you get the STC for auto fuel, you have to get two of them. One to put the fuel in your airplane and the other to use it on the engine. My preference, I'll tell you a little hair raising story. I had gone for about an hour and a uh, 50 minute flight west of me to pick up a previous Stinson owner had sold his airplane and needed a ride back to Greensboro. And I picked him up on landing at uh, Transylvania over at uh, in the uh, west of Asheville, Asheville, the right tank that I had flown in on was down to right at a quarter. So I had Air 100 put in it. I had been running auto fuel. Well, I got back to uh, uh, my, my airport and Bernie Gussmeyer, which some of you may know from previous years, he couldn't make it this year, but his information was, hey, there's an Exxon right down the road that's now selling uh, ethanol-free auto fuel. So I take three cans, get them filled up, come back and test it, no ethanol in it, filled up the right tank. Two days later, I took off with a friend of mine who wanted to go flying, and we uh, just cleared the end of the runway. I had switched over. Well, I always stay on the same tank that I landed on. So now it had auto fuel in it, right? So I took off, and at about 300 feet from the end of the runway, my RPM went down to 2,000, 1,900. What the heck is going on? I checked my Carbide heat? No, it can't be icing up. It's, you know, well, carbide heat, it went down to 1800. And I'm chugging along straight out. No place in the world for me to land. And I'm coming up on Highway 40. Well, my engine quit. One sign above me said uh, Kentucky Fried Chicken, and the other one said Cracker Barrel. That's how I went by. Now my engine has quit, so at that point the only other thing I had not done was switch fuel tanks. I made a switch to the left fuel tank, which had the A100 in it. Uh, I'm sorry, to, anyway, to, I switched to the one that had the A100 in it, and I turned over Ray Lynn's vineyard. Now I got down to about 20 feet of the ugliest look of post you've ever seen holding up their grapevines. And I'm making for an opening to go over onto Route 40, which was only about 60 feet from me, and the engine started running again. Well, I go through the gap in the little bushes, and the semi-truck is holding the traffic back, blowing his horn and going from side to side. I cleared over the hood of him, and now I'm doing 70 miles per hour instead of 56, and my RPM was at about 2200. I climbed out and I said, man, we're going home. I went back and I landed. I parked the airplane and I drained all of the auto fuel out of there. My John Deere tractor, 18 horsepower, would not run on it. Talking to the fuel truck drivers, they said that they had just recently pumped out a tank that was ethanol free. The people had to have their tank pumped out so that they had to have fiberglass tanks put installed. And that fuel was put back in to several different stations, and obviously I had bought some of it. But it had no power. My 18-horse John Deere would not run on it. 
a waste of money and a waste of fuel. So you take your chances. That auto fuel is not tested. And what could I say? If the weed eaters and lawnmower drivers, if they don't complain about it, there's no way for you to even know. Aircraft and M100, if something happens, you're going to know about it right away. They're going to shut that pump down. You know, uh, I've never used anything but 100 cents. Hey, I'll clean my plugs every 10 or 15 hours. It's worth me, my, my safety and, and my well-being. Besides, my little granddaughter likes to fly this airplane. I don't want her to go through what I did. It's a terrible feeling when that engine quits and you've got no place to land except on a, a bunch of steel post holded up grapevines. <laughs> Billy, if I could add, I'm on the opposite end. At our little airport in Kansas, the uh, airport manager came to me and said, hey, we want to put in a uh, fuel pump for you guys. And there's two airplanes on the field, incidentally. Uh, I said, that's great, but uh, if, you, if it's uh, airplane fuel, I won't burn it. And uh, so anyway, long discussion, they put in a mo gas pump. That fuel is tested, and uh, it probably not to the same standards as Hunter Low Lead, but that's 99% of what I burn is uh, mo gas. He's got a point, and I agree with him wholeheartedly, but when you go out to a filling station and fill up two or three five-gallon cans and come back and pour it in your airplane, even though you test it, for water, for, uh, you know, it, 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 it's no good. It may not have the octane that you need. Good. Some people don't realize how to check the uh, fuel for um, uh, alcohol, okay? I, uh, I didn't know for a long time, and I paid 30 bucks on the internet for a guy to send me a little test tube with instructions to go to the grocery store and buy some uh, food coloring, put some of the gasoline in there and shake it up, or if, if, the, uh, the, if it stays in a ball, the food color, it's, there's no alcohol in it, right? And, but if it separates, uh, there is. I gave a uh, one hour uh, seminar for the FIA back in Greensboro, uh, North Carolina on that very subject and I used the water additive. You fill up a little bottle with about three quarters full of uh, the fuel out of your tank that you're getting ready to pour in your airplane, and you pour in one-fourth water, put the lead on it and shake it. If your water, it will migrate into the fuel if you've got alcohol in there. Same thing with the food coloring. If it's got water in there, the entire bottle will turn to the color of the fuel because the alcohol will pull the, the water and the coloring right out of there, the food coloring into it. If it's pure fuel, the food dye will go to the bottom of the jar and it won't mix. Going back to fuel gauges, I just thought of something. I don't care what you do to your fuel gauge, it's not going to be real accurate. The most accurate gauge that I use in my airplane, I don't have a fuel totalizer or anything. I have an app on my co phone called Tank Timer. And you calibrate it periodically uh, to, for your, your burn rate. And it's 10 times more accurate than my gauges. It's uh, called Tank Timer. It's an iPhone app, but I'm not sure if it's for, available for other phones. So Billy, uh, he's an aircraft mechanic, and he found out, a uh, customer surprised him that uh, he's buying a Stinson and wanting him to work on it. So uh, how should we bring that, uh, bring him up to speed so he knows uh, the peculiarities of the Franklin engine and the Stinson? Get your aircraft overhaul manual for the Franklin engine. Go through it quite thoroughly. Several points on that 
regular Continental and Lycoming engine uh, mechanics don't realize when you change the cylinder on the Franklin, you have to seat that cylinder on and only finger tight four of the small nuts on it. Then you install the intake manifold and torque it down. That will align that cylinder with the other two. Now you can, while that's in there, you can put torque on those four nuts that you install finger tight. Take your manifold back off, install the other four larger ones, and now torque those down and you're ready to go back on with the gaskets and the intake manifold. Very important, I've replaced three intake manifolds that people did not know and did not do that. It cracked them. And two of them came to me with JB Weld across the crack all the way up to keep, the, keep, it, keep it running. Uh, it is what it is. Yeah, the torque spark, uh, on your spark plugs is very important. I, uh, I've heard 14, 18. I would not go above 18 foot-pounds on the torque in that little 14 millimeter spark plug. You can't over torque them. Many of the cylinders are old enough that you could pull the helicoil out. You pull the helicoil out, hopefully you can put a new one in back in. Is there anything airframe-wise that uh, they sh he should be uh, uh, educated on or schooled up on? Airframe-wise, one of the best and fastest checks on your airframe that tail, <coughs> excuse me, the tail section is the weakest point on that airframe. You could take, go back and move the tail from side to side with your hand while watching your spring. If that spring rocks a little, <coughs> you've got something loose, something has broke, or corrosion back there. Now you can, they can open up some panels and look in there or use a bore scope to see how much rust, or at the bottom of it, you can get to it with a good sharp ice pick and see if you can punch any holes in it that you think looks like it's rusty. Uh, I have replaced the entire rear section of two Stinsons that broke up there. And it was mostly, and it wasn't so much the rust on it as it was the gentleman flying it in turning around on the narrow runway that he flies out of was dropping the tail wheel off and it had about a two inch difference between the ground next to it and the concrete and it would bump coming back up and it eventually I noticed him pushing it in and he had a lot of side motion and Mr. Cooper has about 14 frames of airplanes and I mentioned it to him and he, he cut off a whole big section of the tail of an airplane and sent it to me so that I could have the repair parts to weld back on there. Uh, Billy, I'm I, not sure which version it is, but could you talk to the fact about the spar on the Dash 3 being a different alloy, and that's something that you really need to pay attention to is on the corrosion of the Dash 3 spar? The wing spar, yes. Very, very important. If you'll look where the wing attachment angles are, under the bottom of the wing, get yourself a bore scope or Hopefully there is an inspection plate on each side of it. Take that off, get in there and look at it. If there is an inspection plate on there, you can't get a bore scope on it. You can always glue a ring around it, cut out the center, do your inspection, put a reinforcing uh, fabric patch over it, dope it, color it the same size, make an inspection plate there so you can get in there and check that spar. But I have, there's, untold number of dash three wings that have been scrapped because of that that spark erosion. Now 
uh, Unibear did have spars that they would sell you, but that involved sell replacing the entire spar, and you're going to run into about six or eight thousand dollars by the time it's through. The reason I bring that up is uh, we had a fly in, we all met at Watertown, and then we did a walk around, and one of the ladies uh, acquired an airplane, a Dash 3, uh, about two years ago, and she believes that the spar was never inspected. She had a problem with the fuel tank, and they were able to inspect it, and it was uh, almost eight through halfway. So uh, if it's a Dash 3, it's uh, something you really got to look at. Negative. We're, we're, we're talking about where the wing strut attaches to the bottom of the wing. Okay. In that area, that's where, that's where, I guess there's a dissimilar metal there that sets up uh, an electrolysis because the back side of that main spar is where it will rust. That torsion tube that's between your front and your rear spar is made out of steel. And it's attached to the aft face of that main, uh, wing spar. And that's obviously where it always corrodes, normally on the aft side or outboard side. Billy, on uh, jumping over to back to the engines, a question that's often asked is uh, on a 165 Franklin, uh, is it better or worse to use high compression pistons? I, uh, I won't go there. I won't go there. Uh, Susan Perel will sell you pistons, and I believe she said a whole set is for $2,000. Six of them, and they will either be cut down by her or her mechanic. They are helicopter pistons, and they're much superior to the standard Franklin piston because they have a steel uh, compression land for the ring and they do not wear out like the standard piston does but they do machine it down a certain two or three thousandths or something uh, to uh, for, for clearance I wouldn't put them in there without a, a good machinist cutting those down and while it's doing it I would also balance those pistons each one of them to make sure that I got them within a half a gram or something. You'll have a good, good smooth running engine that way. And by the way, they are cut down on the skirt to, uh, to balance them. So what, uh, for those of you who couldn't hear, uh, she did some research uh, live here at Oshkosh uh, on the tank timer in the apps. There's several apps. She says there's some for Android phones and one for the uh, uh, iPhone. What I like about the um, iPhone app is it also ties to your GPS. So if you put a burn rate of, let's say, four and a half gallons an hour on taxi, uh, it knows that, and climb out, I think I got a set to go to 12, and a cruise, it's uh, almost 10. So, but the, your point is, make sure it's an aviation uh, app. Yeah. And if you have Android, you can't get the iPhone app. The app that you mentioned is not available on all Android. Okay. There are Android apps that you have to have the iPhone app. Okay. Because the iPhone app has the function. Okay, thank you. So uh, that's good information. Billy, uh, back to the engines. Uh, could you go through the different engines that uh, 
have been made available on the, the Stinsons, you know, the 150, 165, and the heavy case and the light case and all that? Oh, wow, well, that's, that's a big order. <laughs> yes. Uh, you do know that the heavy case and the light case is identified by the serial numbers on the side of them. Uh, the, uh, most of your heavy cases went on the dash two and dash threes. Up until that time, most of the Franklin engines were light case. The, uh, I have seen a couple of dash threes that had light cases on them, and there is a, an inspection that you do by pulling off the top cover and seeing if there's any cracks in the attaching bosses inside where the two mating surfaces come together. And they, frankly, I've never found any. I, uh, you're, uh, I guess, uh, you know, it, uh, you, you, you can find them uh, either way. Your uh, 150 cylinder, your 150 engine is distinctively different in the pushrod housings, the pushrod uh, lifting holes that go into the side of the engine. So if you're going to replace pushrod seals or something, make sure you order the two different sizes for the outer and the inside of that push rod uh, for the 150, I mean the, the 165. Now the 150 uses the same size uh, packings on both and I use nothing but real gaskets because they will withstand. If you go three years from now and you decide that, you, hey, the engine's not running quite right, I need to adjust the valve clearances again or check the clearances on it, you take it apart. There's real gaskets, you can take them, wash them with a warm soapy water, rinse them off, dry them real good, reuse them. Uh, if you don't use real gaskets, you'll find yourself throwing them away and buying new ones each time. Just as an interesting point, who knows what automobile used the Franklin engine? Tucker, Tucker that's right. And which engine was that? 220 horsepower helicopter engine, right? That's right. They were also used in tanks, uh, drones, helicopters. In fact, uh, going back just 15 or 20 years ago, I think the Air Force dumped a whole bunch of the uh, Franklin engines on the market because they had pulled them all out and replaced them out of their helicopters. Hey, if you ever have a barn find and you do find a Tucker at a barn, the last one sold at auction at 1.3 million. <laughs> That's called a good barn for find, isn't it? So the question was, what's the uh, approximate percent of ownership of Franklin engines versus uh, other engines, correct? That's fine. I have no idea. We'd have to go to uh, down at the antique building at the Stinson Type Club. Most of the visitors have put the type of airplane they have and possibly the type of engine that's in it. That's all good information. That's the only source that I can uh, think of that would be available for us. Okay. Uh, excuse me, but Randy, do you have a gut feel for that? 80-20 is Franklin. Yeah, 80-20 Franklin. That's why what I would have guessed too. Any other Stinson owner guess at that? Is that about right? Hey, incidentally, if you're a Stinson owner, raise your hand. All right, great. So those of you that that don't own a Stinson, these are the people you want to talk to because they'll convince you that it's the best value in aviation. Do you have an opinion on the optimal engine that we're talking about right now? What would you like to have? 0360, Lycoming. Like that would be my preference. Some could not hear the question. If you were looking for a new Stinson, 
and uh, what would be your best engine option? So the question is, if you're coming up to overhaul on a Franklin, what should you do? Really? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> At that point, the teardown mechanic is going to overhaul your engine. I would get a an opinion from him. He's going to inspect to make sure your, your crankshaft's not worn out, your cam's not worn out, your case is not cracked. Once you get these things together, you're going to know your approximate cost of the overhaul. At that point, it might be your advantageous decision to go to a Lycone wing or an old 470 or whatever your choice thoughts may be. Out on a flight line are some great examples of converted Stinsons out there. There's, there's, I think there's about three different conversions out there on the line. So the question is, where are the Stinsons? Uh, just go find row 80, 80, 80 0, uh, and on the uh, west side of the, uh, the, the road there, uh, there's, uh, in that vicinity, there's at least 30 to 35 Stinsons. Yeah, I think there is 34 to 36 Stinsons parked in two rows there, and one sitting up on top of the hill, so you can't miss them. So uh, he said, to, he asked the question that Chris at Airworks, okay, is offering ported Franklin engines. What, what does that mean is what you're facing? The induction system? Okay, do you know anything about the ported engines that Chris is offering? I know nothing about it. I know that... Uh, my dad, which ran American Aeromotive out of Miami, if anybody from Southern Florida may have ran across him, but he would port, and what that means is they polish the intake very smoothly. Every crack, every crack, every mold bump in it is smoothed out to where it's almost like glass. He did that to a Volkswagen Carmen Ghia one of the last year that they were built. I think he had 20 miles on it whenever he pulled the cylinders off and he ported everything on it, put it back on with a, uh, a little uh, banana uh, cluster exhaust on it. And that thing would outrun and outscoot a Carmen Ghia. <laughs> so it does, it's very advantageous to get that in, intake smoothed out so that the airflow is good. You want to know the difference between a two and the three, but specifically, what was it? Flying characteristics. Flying, yeah, flying characteristics between the dash two and the dash three. And any other major difference? Yeah. No flying difference between them. I think the engineers were pretty specific whenever they called it the 108, because that's about how many knots you're going to make. I don't care what engine you put in it, you're not going to cruise much faster. You'll take off with a shorter distance and climb a lot faster with the more horsepower engines in it, but they'll all cruise about one eight knots. Uh, major difference that I noticed, the dash three that I had when the wind was up about 15 to 20 miles an hour, if it was hitting crosswise to you, you almost needed someone to walk the wing or you were spending a lot of time doing submarine uh, S-turns to, to get to where you were going. That 
big tail will weather van you. This is a uh, this is a slide that we'll be presenting later. This talks about the uh, some of the differences. Let's see if I can get this all pop up there. So the year, the number. One of the differences, uh, I have a dash two. I wished I had the rudder trim. So uh, that's one of the differences. I do not. I have a bungee rudder trim. Uh, it kind of works. Um, I wish I had bigger fuel tanks that the dash three has. Um, but other than that, it's ba basically the same airplane. They did build it as different payloads as they built each one, they were able to up the payload on it. And I understand the Dash 3 has one thicker uh, 45 degree piece of uh, tubing that goes from the center of the wing shield uh, back to the main wing spar attachment. It's just a thicker wall tubing. That's the only difference I've found in any of the structural parts of the fuselages. In fact, I proved that you can put a Dash 3 tail on a straight 108. There's no difference in the frames. All the fittings and everything is right in the same spot. <laughs> well, what can I say? I, I would never do that, but it can be done. Uh, that's the way Baltese built the airplane. Each fuselage, I guess, was put in a jig, and the guys were on each side that were welding it just put the pieces in place and tacked her up and welded it, and it moved on down the line. The, uh, the wings are no different. The wings, each wing will go on any of the 108s. You can put dash three wings on a straight 108 or a dash one or a dash two, and there is two or three field approvals that that has been done with. So if you want to do that and take a chance on that wing spar six or eight years down the road corroding and then you're out looking for another set of wings, you could do that, but who would want to? Uh, your bungee kits, putting bungee, rudder bungee kits on Straight one, uh, straight 108s or straight uh, the dash two, dash one. Uh, most of the, I think your dash twos, most of them came out with the bungee kits already on them. Uh, a little hair raising story. One of the captains at uh, for United Airlines came down. He was up at Lock Haven and he had just bought this Stinson and had a brand new. 165 put on it. It was a a dash one, and when they had covered it, they had covered the fuel tanks with fabric. And one of our Stinson owners saw it. Lynn O'Donnell was the one. In fact, I she she won't mind me using her name here. But she pointed out to him that that fabric was not supposed to be over top that tank. There's an AD note on dash twos to remove that or never put fabric on there to run that fabric four inches down, attach it to inboard and outboard ribs and to the aft and forward surfaces of your wing spars. And then install your tank and borderline your tank with fabric. Uh, this gentleman, the whole tank was covered, and she sent him down to me, and he had ordered a bungee rudder kit to put on it. It had been a dash one, and he figured since he had the higher horsepower engine, he'd like to just have it act like a dash two. Well, I did all the work for him, and he came down after about three weeks, and I'm telling him now, you know, when you take off, I set up this trim in a kind of a neutral position. So be ready on your right rudder when you get to the end of the runway because the torque will take 
want to run you off to the left and on climb out you reach up and adjust your elevator and your rudder trim to where it feels best go up to three or four thousand get it in cruise and set it to where you can fly it with hands off with adjusting both of them i've got to do that and fly it too i said well yeah that's a single operating airplane you know yes you do well Yes, and I said, all right, would you feel better if I went with you the first time? I sure would. Okay, I'm in the right seat. He taxes out, and I said, now, you've got the right wheel on the center line. When we start rolling, try to get it back a straddle of the center line and keep it that way by the right rudder, keep it, keep it in there. And I said, now, you're going to find a difference in your rudder pressures because you're operating against 30 pounds of spring tension back there in that bungee kit. Okay, you ready to go? I said, yeah, I'm ready. You're the captain. Well, he came on with the power and he hadn't ran 60 feet until the left wheel's off in the grass. I said, John, right rudder, buddy, get back on the runway. Well, he straddled the runway light and the right wheel came off. Now I'm looking for some here to the bow wing at a windsock and a 172 sitting down there. John, you're headed right straight towards him. All right, John, I've got it. And I stomped the right rudder and got it away from those. We went down an embankment and about two feet before going into the lake at Sugar Valley, I got it to flying. And I went back over to the top of the runway and set it up on 70. John, you've got it. Keep it on 70, all right? And I'll work your trim. Tell me which way you want it. All right, trim feels good. John, you're down to 65, buddy. <laughs> Lower the nose a little bit. Okay, so we get out, we've made several figure eights, and he said, all right, I think I've got it. We came back for landing, and he was all over the place and bounced about four times. And I said, well, you can log four of them on that. <laughs> and we, we pulled up in front of the hangar and he said, you know, I think that wind is, is going to be up in Virginia whenever I get there. Now, he was going to Allentown, Pennsylvania. He said, I don't think I better go this evening. He said, it's, it's going to be stronger whenever I get up there at about 2 o'clock. I said, all right, what do you want me to do? I'll take you back to a motel? or but He said, no. He said, uh, how about taking me over to Greensboro and let me catch an, uh, a United flight out of there? I'll go back home. Meanwhile, you get me a an instructor that can fly with me for three or four hours and let bring me up to speed on it. <laughs> so we did that and I did get him an instructor and he did come back and and fly it and he has since sold the airplane but uh, he was very uncomfortable in it and it will that bungee rudder kit is very strong up until that point you're straight 108 and you're 108 one all you've got is a cable that goes back to each side of the rudder. And when you go to adjust the tension on it, the little turnbuckles is right up beside the rudder pedal. And you tighten, if you, I put a block so that the rudder is straight forward and aft. And my rudder pedals are straight across. And then you go to the turnbuckle and you tighten it until you see the little return spring start to stretch about a half an inch. Safety wire the turnbuckle. Go to the other side and do the same thing. Tighten it up until the return spring stretches about a half an inch. Turn, but that is your tension on it. You won't find the tension in the, in the log books any place unless you have the bungee kit on it. And that is spelled out in another page in another section of the repair manual. The question is, can we add a dash three rudder trim tab to a dash two or one or whatever? No, can't be done. There is, there is another difference that we should have on that slide between the one, two and then the dash three. The dash three came from the factory with right rudders, or excuse me, right brakes. Uh, the Dash 2s do, did not come out of the factory with it. May, it may have been an option, but mine don't have it. I prefer not to ha 
not to allow the uh, passengers to have access to the brakes. So <laughs> I, I don't want to convert it, but there are cases like uh, uh, back here, uh, uh, they are training in the uh, 108 and they did put brake. Uh, Julie, is yours a dash two? Or da dash one, okay. So, but it can be done. The conversion on doing that is not that difficult. Of course, Univer sells the kit. I don't know how much it is. I think that I bought the right brake kit. It was about 800 and some dollars, but it's probably double that now. Okay, so it's about $3,600. It's, it's hard to believe they can make it for that, isn't it? The kit itself is not that difficult to install. Uh, there is some minor welding that needed to be done. They've improved on it then. Yeah. And it's tied together with torque tubes. It doesn't have a separate uh, cylinders. That's kind of like which brand of oil uh, to use. It's a lot of controversy over that. So, uh, Billy, the question is, uh, how do the airplanes fly differently? The Dash 3 versus the Dash 2, and specifically around the, the big, big rudder? No difference in the way it flies. It flies and handles the same, except on the ground. On the ground, it, it could weather vane. The large tail could you, yes. The Dash 3 is known to weather vane with you. And I've heard what the crosswind component on all of them, I believe, is like 12 knots. I have landed mine with gust up to about 43. <laughs> they, they will do it with the right technique. You can come in and put it down the uh, low wing and that gear into the wind and Whenever it touches down, get the other side down. And a unique thing is on your flaps, if you're using flaps, you want to get that tail down, smack that button pretty hard with the palm of your hand. And that, that Johnson bar will fly to the floor and your flaps are up and you've got your tail down. We've had uh, aircraft uh, here this week that's uh, traveled from Seattle, from Phoenix, from Miami. Um, we also have a, uh, uh, a good number of uh, women pilots this year. Uh, also, our club numbers. Uh, Mark, uh, Julie, what were the club numbers reported last night? It had been like 400, and now it's what? Becoming a, a I, I think people are finding the hidden hidden gem in aviation. Yeah. Yes, sir. In, in reference to that, the, the Facebook page and the website, boy, if you've got a question, put it out there, and within a matter of minutes, you've got people responding to it. So it's right. like very responsive. Go ahead and talk to that, and I'll show them the other resources. 
Yeah, the uh, question was, uh, if you have a question, something involving your airplane, put it on that website, and within minutes, you'll get an answer to it. Is the Stinson hard to fly? No, the Stinson is very forgiving, very easy to fly. If Now, I'm going to brag a little. My granddaughter, which has been up here about three times with me, and she's in college right now in her second, third year, uh, on her 10th birthday, she came up and took me flying in serial number 88 from runway takeoff all the way back to landing on the grass. She handled it at 10 years old. And proof of it is on the form uh, YouTube, Chloe Texas Flying. My son sat in the back seat looking over her shoulder, taking a picture, and we had a GoPro setting up on the uh, uh, PDOT tube, adjusted, and she did a superb job. And she won't let me sell that airplane. She says that's hers. So, so the, co the comment about the support, the support of the, in the, inter uh, the Stinson uh, group is uh, phenomenal. That's really outstanding. You will have an answer in a few moments. But here's a listing of the resources. Uh, the website, um, most of the information is available, but uh, if you're really thinking about buying a Stinson, you need to join the International Stinson Club. Julie, remember how much the dues are? What, 30, 40 bucks a year, something like that? Something like that. It's, it's a great investment. Uh, also, this uh, seminar here today as well as all the other seminars that we have other locations are recorded by Randy Phillips back here. He's a professional videographer. And then these are uploaded to uh, the YouTube channel. Um, and those of us that are uh, what we call ambassadors that promote the brand, when we do work ourselves on the airplane, we typically uh, record it and to make it available to Randy. It's not the quality that Randy produces, but uh, it's helpful information so that uh, YouTube, the Stinson Tech Channel on YouTube is very uh, good. Also, we have virtual gatherings on the, the internet. And uh, we have a once a year event in Beaumont, Kansas. It's not Texas, Beaumont, Kansas. And uh, it's a little cow town of a, a population of 65. It's where the world's largest shipping point of cattle was in, in the 1800s. Um, Anyway, you land in a pasture, tax, uh, go to a blacktop road, taxi into town, uh, about an eighth of a uh, quarter of a mile, stop at the stop sign, and uh, this is uh, a, uh, the nation's oldest uh, wooden water tire for steam locomotives. Anyway, there's an old hotel there, and we have fun for three days. Uh, it's the end of September. Really encourage you all to attend it. I hope to see you down at the type tent. Billy, the question is, uh, what are Stinson owners uh, using for ADSB out? Would some of you uh, help us answer that question? The ADSB out? U avionics, Mark. We've got the Garmin uh, 335 transponder. I know there are a number of people using the U avionics. Uh, Sky Beacon and more recently the Tail Beacon. Uh, I think we've got examples out there on the row of several different combinations. Also the Stratus, the Stratus, and the other transponders. But just go down the row and look at the different. You'll see several of them amongst our group. Yeah, I personally went with the uh, Garmin GDL82. Uh, did the installation myself with the oversight of an IA, and uh, it was a uh, challenge because all the coax had to be replaced in the aircraft to uh, RG400. Uh, but uh, looking back on it, I think I would have gone the direction of what you did, Mark, uh, or the UAvionics. It just was much simpler. I've installed about 15 of the UAvionics. It's uh, splicing in of two wires. Mounting it on, same as what your your wing light was attached to. You've got a ground and you've got a power light. 
uh, where you've got the same with the tail beacon. If you want to put it back there, you've got the same thing with that. Very easy. Now, I do go to one step further. I make sure that I've got a ground wire between the rudder and the main fuselage. And I do that at, down at the bottom hinge. So, Billy, maybe you can answer that since you put so many of the UAvionics in. He asked the question, is there any issues, have you had any issues with the wiring that's already there uh, supplying power to the UAvionics? Is that correct? Yeah, using connectors versus direct. Uh, what's your experience? It's my preference to install those using the original wiring. Uh, I haven't ran across a point where I had to replace any of the wiring on them, but the power wire and the ground wire, I use an inline soldering splice. You take a splice of shielding off of your wire, stick both pieces of wire in and the center of it, you'll see a little round ball of solder and you push those in and hold them in that position and with a heat gun, very slowly around it, it melts the sorter and it shrinks the outer uh, covering on it to give it a watertight, waterproof seal. So, uh, Billy, he asked a question. How much can one expect to spend for a Stinson? In, anywhere from to, to spend on a Stinson that you're looking at to buy depends on entirely how much work you're going to have to be doing to it to bring it up to the speed you want. I've seen them as cheap as eleven or twelve thousand uh, dollars. I bought my first one for sixteen thousand and did a number of small repairs to it, painted some areas to it, and uh, put new uh, cylinders on it, and wound up selling it for 28. Uh, you can expect to pay up to, I would say, $40,000, depending on the type of engine that's in it and the conditions of it and the engine. I agree with that, but there's uh, been a lot of them that's been engine conversion. They basically have a new engine. Some of those are selling around 50000 and it's and it's a great value. The, uh, all I can say is, on, on that note is, there's not a smoother running engine than that Franklin. You fly behind a, a Franklin engine, you're going to find the smoothest less vibrating engine of any of them. If you do think it's vibrating or if it's not running correctly, the manual will tell you if you think you've got a problem, bleed and readjust your hydraulic lifters. There's a tool that is supposedly be able to put pressure on that rocker arm and bleed the lifters. My dad taught me, don't go that route. Take your rocker arms off, take the push rods out, remove your push rod housings, reach in there with a little magnet and pull your lifters out. Take your lifters and, and put them in a, a gallon can of uh, cleaning solvent, take them apart, wash them, clean them out good, blow them dry, put them back in dry. Set your adjustment once you get your push rods back in and your housing back in there with new packings or your packings cleaned up and reinstalled now you set your 40 thousandths adjustment on it and go to the next cylinder in the direction of firing order do all six of them that way and you'll have one of the smoothest and best running engines out there
Billy, the question is, is anybody producing the, flatch, the flap hinge covers? Uh, head protectors, right? Yeah. yeah. Not that I know of. I uh, misplaced mine once in putting uh, seal number 88 together and had to go out and take the uh, hinge cover off of another one and brought it in and remade one. Put the, put the one back and two days later and the box was picked up, I found the part in the empty box underneath it. So, no, I don't know of anybody that's making one, but I'm sure if you put in a request, somebody can make it for you. There was somebody on uh, Facebook that uh, offered to make some out of 3D printed material. Um, I never pursued that, but uh, there may be some other sources. If you haven't been down to the type tent, the antique building, go in and go find our Stinson table, sign in and meet Lynn O'Donnell or whoever is down there and uh, I will be down there for the rest of the day after I leave here and questions come up we'll be glad to help you and answer them and guide you in the right direction if we can. <laughs>